Hi everyone, my name is Rob Orr, clinical my therapist and credentialed McKenzie therapist based in private practice in Coburg, East Melbourne. This next exercise is a fantastic exercise for a number of different reasons. It can once again be a good exercise for a stiff thoracic, hyperkyphotic thoracic, very tight functional front line, functional back line, regards to anatomy trains, and also connected with the arm lines as well. It's great for tight neck region, thoracic shoulders. So it's a very good functional stretch, this one. It's based more on soft tissue now than my fascial structures. So we have a partial squat against the wall. And then I just gently just flatten my back against the wall so there's no space. And you probably only, so this will only be a very minor movement. This is probably the only time I do advise having a flat back uh, against the wall. Then from here, I bring my arms up to 90 degrees, lock my elbows into the wall, and I roll my arms back into the start position. I keep my head in a nice position, so I'm not forward. I'm not sticking my chin out. I'm in a nice plumb line position. And remember, your lower back has to make contact with the wall with this one. From here, I then slide my elbows up the wall until I feel first onset of resistance, which should be a stretch. I hold for five seconds. After a five second hold, I drop my arms down till I feel a decrease in that stretch. Some clients will probably say this is a relief. And then I do the same movement again till I get to, once again, my bind, which is that first onset of resistance. Don't push through the bind, it's a pretty powerful stretch. And I just do five in a row. I like to sort of recommend two to three sets every day. Five repetitions per set and hold each rep for five seconds. Just to explain to your client while you're doing this exercise that it can be a little bit uncomfortable. They can feel quite tight through that neck area because it's a very powerful stretch. And about 30 seconds after the stretch, they're gonna feel probably just a little bit, little bit tight and possibly a little bit achy. But that should subside within 30 seconds to 60 seconds. So it's a very, very good stretch and a very functional stretch for a lot of the tight myofascial structures in that region. So once again, not just for a client, but also very good for a therapist too, since we're always going forward. Let's open everything up and come back. Thank you. Hello from Associated Body Work and Massage Professionals, the leading association for massage therapists in the United States. I'm Leslie Young and I'm ABMP's International Ambassador. I'm so excited about our new partnership with Massage and Myotherapy Australia. Now MMA members can join as ABMP associate members at a deep discount and access more than 200 hours of online continuing education and other member benefits. So for more information, visit abmp.com slash MMA. Together, we look forward to supporting you and your career. Tell the client, in a moment, I'm going to ask you to turn over onto your back. Then remove all bolsters and pillows. Grasp the draping at the mid-neck and at the feet. Lift the draping directly upwards to make a tent shape. The client should be covered. Secure the draping against the side of the table with your leg. Now say to the client, slowly turn over with your back toward me so you are lying face up. Once the client has turned over, gently lower the draping which should cover the client from the shoulders to at least the knees. Ask the client if they would like a pillow under their head and bolster under their knees. Their arms can be either under or on top of the draping. The same process applies if turning the client from their front onto their back, except they will be laying face down. Um, I'm Jeff Shearer from Ethical Practice and Evolved Natural Medicine. So I've been a massage therapist since 1995. Um, running my practice of old natural medicine now in Newcastle, New South Wales and I uh, also run a training business called Ethical Practice to help support practitioners in being able to understand the nuances of developing a practice. 
funnily enough, I'd been travelling for about three and a half years. I was overseas, uh, I decided it was time to come home. And I'd done a lot of different jobs, worked in hospitality, bars, restaurants, kitchens, all that sort of stuff. Uh, dug holes for a living, landscaping, those sorts of things. And I decided that, well, if I'm gonna come home, maybe it's time I started thinking about you know, a longer term approach, a longer term sort of career. And so I used a, a, a psychology technique, I suppose. Um, the idea of you ask someone a question, trying to tap into the subconscious and the first answer that pops into their head is the answer. And so basically I asked myself the question, what did I want from a job? And the answer that came back was, I wanted to feel like I'd done something worthwhile at the end of the day, had some kind of positive impact in the world. I know it sounds a bit cliche, but that's what it was for me back in my early 20s. The next question was, what's gonna give me that? And massage therapy popped into my head. So based off the back of that, I came home, signed up for a 12 month massage course, and that was 23 years ago. One of the things I suppose I found early in, the, early in the piece was how hard it was to actually build a practice um, effectively. I you know, really spent probably about seven years bumbling around in the wasteland trying to figure it out. And so I, uh, as I started to create some success for myself, I started to get to a point where I needed more time. And you know, obviously there's that time um, time for money sort of ratio that you've got to be a little bit careful of, particularly in massage therapists, because it's so easy to physically burn yourself out, let alone mentally burn yourself out. So I decided to start bringing on practitioners to work with me. And in the process of that, uh, we decided to set up a, a staff training program to try and help practitioners coming into the industry to understand some of the lessons I'd learned along the way. Coming off the back of doing the, the staff training program, one of the things that I, I recognised in the very first instance that I had someone come to work with me was that it was an unmitigated disaster. And really that came down to the fact that I made a lot of assumptions, that that person um, understood a lot of the nuances of communicating with people, running a practice, dealing with client retention, dealing with difficult, difficult clients, all those sorts of things. And so, as a result of that, as I said earlier, um, my partner and I decided to develop a staff training program. And I went through every single little detail of what I do in my practice from someone walking through the door to why I do it. And so from the, ba from the back of that, we developed essentially a 12 month training program so that anyone that came to work with us, at some point, eventually they're gonna leave we want them to be able to go out into the world and survive on their own. And so once we developed that, we realised, looking back through my history, how hard it was trying to set up a, a practice, we realised that this was something that perhaps the industry needed. And so that's where ethical practice came from. Um, starting to go out into the industry, uh, massage therapists, uh, Chinese medicine practitioners, homeopaths, naturopaths, and actually assist them to be able to make the complementary uh, medicine industry uh, more effective and more solid in its grounding. When I first started presenting, I was terrified. And so I thought, well, if I'm worried about making mistakes up on stage, saying the wrong thing, then how do I go about minimising that risk? I always think uh, that if you stand up in front of more than four people in a room and present information, the rabbit in the headlight syndrome can kind of occur, in, in which case 90% of your brain falls out. So what do you do to overcome that? And so what I've found works really well for me, and I know there are other presenters out there that, that, that don't find this is the right way for them, but what I've found for me is I go over my presentation again and again and again. The first presentation I ever did I went over it every day for 10 weeks. And so when that rabbit in the headlight syndrome happens, and it inevitably does, it doesn't matter how long you've been presenting, uh, I've been doing it now for over 10 years and I still get those moments where, you know, the frightened rabbit sort of occurs. If I've got that memory retention, and it doesn't have to be rote learnt, if I've got that memory retention, if I know where I am and I know where, where I need to be, it's a lot easier for me to be able to do that effectively. That then shows a level of confidence. Um, when there's a level of confidence in how you present, people start to take what you're saying more seriously. And obviously, 
I'm really passionate about the information that I convey to practitioners. And so if I want them to be able to take that up, I need to actually take myself seriously and really sit down and make sure I'm prepared, not turning up with a screwed up bit of paper that I've pulled out of the bottom of my bag trying to figure out what am I going to say. So for me, it's really preparation. One of the more common issues that practitioners sort of ask, ask me about is their practice isn't busy enough. And essentially, I, I look at it that there's two main reasons for that. One, there's not an effective marketing strategy that enables people to find you and then contact you. Um, well, it's really three, I suppose. The second one is not handling that contact well. And the third is really, if we don't retain clients, then we're not going to be able to help them get where they need to go. Now, I'm not talking about retaining clients in the sense of I want someone to come back for the rest of their lives because it's better for my you know, um, bottom line. I'm talking about the idea of us owning uh, the, how do I put it, owning the, uh, the advice that we believe that they need to take. So if someone comes to see me, say, with a neck problem and it, they've had it for a month, it's pretty unlikely I'm going to be able to resolve that in one session. And so my uh, responsibility or my duty of care to that person is to advise them what I think they need. And I do find a lot of times practitioners really struggle with this. Uh, they get caught up in the idea of I don't want to appear too salesy, I don't want to appear too pushy, and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not suggesting you need to be, but we do need, do need to own our industry and we need, do need to be professional. And as I said, I believe it's our duty of care to provide our clients with our best professional advice. So in my case, in that instance, I might say to someone at the end of that session, look, this is not going to resolve the problem. Certainly, you feel better. Um, hopefully, tomorrow you're going to feel better again. But I need to see you a few more times. Now, when I give them that advice, I need to be specific. A few more times is how long's a piece of string? Now, sure, we might find that one person might respond in two sessions and someone else might respond better in four. And so I always give my clients my best educated guess on their situation. So I might say to them, look, in this circumstance, based on my experience, I would expect I'd need to see you once a week for the next four weeks. How does that sound to you? Now, I don't think that sounds pushy. Um, I think it sounds upfront. I'm explaining to the person what I think they need. I'm then giving them the responsibility to make the decision. I'm not being pushy. And then they can actually decide what they want to do from there. If they decide they don't want to come back, there's no problems. But if I don't advise them, then they don't know what to expect. And invariably what happens, a lot of times, someone will walk out of a session with a practitioner. They haven't been told what to expect. Two days later, the pain starts to return and they think what that practitioner didn't do what that practitioner did didn't work, but worse, they think that the modality didn't work. So it's not just our responsibility to our client, it's our responsibility to our modality. I think the reason why we decided to call ethical practice, the name of the business ethical practice, was try to, help, to try and help practitioners to understand that you don't have to have ethics in business or success. You can have both. Now, there are lots of practitioners out there that perhaps are you know, selling business training programs that are telling us that we can make $500 now. I don't really, I'm not really interested in that. I'm more interested in practitioners being able to be successful, being able to create a sustainable long-term business a sustainable income to be able to support their family, to be able to do the things in their lives that they want to be able to do without killing themselves in the process. Sure, if you want to make $500 an hour, that's fine. It's not what I'm interested in. And I know that in my experience, most practitioners aren't either. They want to be able to help people, just like why I got into the industry. And so the reason we decided to call it ethical practice was to help practitioners understand that you can have success with integrity. You can have success and still maintain your ethics. You can be a business person and be ethical. You can market your business effectively, but not sell out in the process. 
The advice I'd give to practitioners who are struggling is number one, when you're going into a small business, if you look at the statistics, on average it takes a small business two years before they actually start to break even. Now, before you freak out, I understand that that's a fairly challenging concept. I don't actually believe that that's a reality in a business like massage therapy. I think you can um, build sustainability or, or financial um, stability more quickly. But I think the expectation is that within a month or two months or three months, we're going to go from having zero clients to 30 clients a week. And I don't think that's reasonable. I don't think it's a reasonable expectation. And so when we don't achieve that, then we consider ourselves a failure. I think it's important to go back to what your love is for this industry. So any time that I've gone through a difficult time in my practice, and I've gone through many, I've been in the industry 23 years, I've burnt myself out twice, so I, I've been around the ring a few times. But it's when I go back to the passion that I have for my practice, when I go back to the passion that I have for my modality, when I go back to the passion that I have for being able to help people with their pain, their suffering and their distress, that's the thing that drives me forward. The second thing really is you actually need to acknowledge where you're struggling. Putting your head in the sand isn't going to make any, any difference. If you continue to do the things you've always done, you'll continue to get the same results. Certainly don't expect results in an unreasonable period of time, but also recognise if something's not working, maybe you need to adapt it. That's certainly what I've found in my experience in practice. Again, I've been doing it 23 years. In the last five years, I've worked in three completely different cities in Australia. I've moved my practice three times. Each of those practices have, create, uh, have been able to achieve financial success and financial stability in a relatively short period of time. And the way that I've been able to do that is I've looked at every day, what do I need to do? I go out and network with other practitioners. I market myself effectively. I make sure my website SEO works really well. I get out and I meet people in the community. I don't hide away in my office, in my practice, sitting behind the desk, hoping that something's going to work. To find out more about ethical practice, go to all the w's.ethicalpractice.net. We've got a whole bunch of free resources. Uh, we've got some online courses that are financially easy to access. Uh, we're not charging $1,000 for courses. We try to make it cost effective for people because we want you to succeed and be able to create a successful and ethical practice. Joining Massage and Myotherapy Australia is easy. Visit the Massage and Myotherapy Australia website www.massagemyotherapy.com.au Click join now where you can either join online or download an application form. Your qualification will define which level you join, massage, remedial or advanced member. Ensure you provide all information requested, including certified copies of your academic transcript, qualification certificate and statutory declaration. It's important you certify documents and complete the statutory declaration. Documents can be certified by members of certain professions, such as medical practitioners and pharmacists. Also ensure you provide clinic details, first aid certificate and insurance certificate of currency. If you choose our preferred insurer Aon, you'll be eligible to receive a discount. Once your membership is processed, Contact Aon directly via the Massage and Myotherapy Australia website. Once the association receives all required information, your application will be processed. Join now and choose the Association of Professional Therapists. Hi, I'm James. I'm a business coach for massage therapists with Massage Champions. And I'm gonna speak with you today about numbers. 
Now before you freak out, I'm gonna make sure this is really easy and you understand the most important numbers that you need to be able to make sure that your business succeeds. And I know, you know, a lot of massage therapists get into this industry because they're so touchy-feely, they love the hands-on backs, but when it comes to the business side of things, sometimes even the mention of numbers can cause a bit of a freak out. But what I wanna do right now is make sure that you've got a concept of the two most important numbers and even just a general understanding of these will change the way that you do marketing and grow your business. Now the first thing I want you to have a look at is the what we call lifetime value of your client or your customer. And this is something that a lot of business people across all sorts of industries understand. But in massage specifically, it means when you get a new client, what can you expect to be the average lifetime spend that they will spend with you? And if you think, well, you know, an average client might come in 10 times a year, and maybe you charge $85 a treatment, and maybe they spend a little bit on product here and there as well, you might find that the average uh, for that for that one person who comes back all the time might be $900 across a year. Now, of course, you're gonna have some people who don't come back and you're gonna have some who stay for many years. So if we just kind of rule of thumb, go $900 a year for this example, but you'll have to look at your numbers to figure it out. That's the first thing that I want you to understand because what that means is every new person who comes in your door is literally worth 900 bucks to you. And suddenly that number gives you a little bit more leverage in the way that you do marketing, the way you do advertising to attract those people in. Because the second number I want you to understand is what we call cost of acquisition. How much did it cost you to actually get that client to come in? Now, some people do just free marketing. They just do word of mouth. They just do some free Facebook posts. And for some people, that works enough. You know, they've been around long enough. They've got a reputation. They don't need to pay for clients to come in. Or well, essentially, they're kind of paying with their reputation and the time they've put in. In that case, it's easy. Cost of acquisition, cost of getting that person in the door is literally zero. But for most of us, if you're still building, if you're proactively doing marketing and advertising, it is going to cost something. It's going to cost some Facebook ads, or it might cost an ad in the local newspaper. Or maybe you're uh, paying in kind. You might be giving uh, a discount to someone to be able to encourage them to come in. That, that's still a cost to you, the discount. And so you might be able to look at it and say, great, I've spent $30 on Facebook ads this week and got one client coming in. The cost of acquiring that client from that ad is $30. Now some people go, 30 bucks, you know, that's a lot for an acquisition cost. Uh, I only get $85 for the treatment. I'm spending 30 of it just getting them to come in. But what you've forgotten is that the lifetime value of that client is $900. And so suddenly saying, well, $30 to make 900 actually sounds pretty good to me. And it does rely on you being able to rebook regularly to have that kind of relationship with your clients where they want to come in more and more often that they're building that rapport with you. But that's all part of practice in the business as well. The more you can encourage people to come back to have that long-term relationship, the higher that lifetime value gets. And then the better you get at advertising and the more things you can do for free, the lower the cost of acquisition gets. And when you can understand those two numbers, all of a sudden you can see, hey, this piece of marketing is working really well for me. Or conversely, this piece of marketing is not. And being able to understand the lifetime value of your clients and the cost of acquisition of getting someone new in will absolutely change the game for how you think about marketing going forward. So I want you to do some number crunching right now. Actually go and look, what is the average lifetime value of your clients? Go and have a look at that. Do you need to be able to improve your skills so you can raise that up a little bit? And what's your average cost of acquisition? Are you spending enough? Are you not spending enough? How can you make sure that those two things are in balance? And the only way to do it is by going and having a look. It won't take long, it's actually pretty easy to find out these two numbers and it makes a huge difference.